Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Well, good, good evening, folks, and thank you for coming out on this uh, cloudy night. I guess we're in the middle of a cloud here. Uh, and uh, as uh, was just said, I am here to talk about comets, a subject that I love. And what we're going to do is talk about some things that uh, we all know about just to get some background. And then we'll talk about a few things that maybe some of us don't know about. So that's kind of the menu. And uh, if uh, there are questions, uh, you can just uh, wave your arms and, and yell and I'll be happy to answer questions. So what we're going to do uh, is, uh, as I mentioned, two things. Uh, we'll talk a little bit in terms of an introduction as to what it is that we all know about comets. But the more important thing is that we will also talk about what it is that remains to be learned about comets, what we need to know about comets. Okay? And a good place to always begin a talk of this sort is to try to explain to normal people why people like me get excited about comets. Why are comets important? So I threw in a few slides here to sort of motivate the discussion. These are things that you all know, but just in case you don't, I just want you to know these things. Uh, why are comets important? Well, one reason is that once you go to the edges of the solar system, beyond where Neptune is, the solar system is full of comets. And there is a number on the slide down here that's uh, about a million, million comets that are out there out beyond the orbit of Neptune and out to the distance of the halfway to the nearest star. So they are, in fact, the most numerous objects in the solar system. So they do deserve some attention. But they're more important than that. And to scientists like me, reason, one reason they're important is because many of them, in certain ways, haven't changed very much since they formed at the beginning of the solar system 4.6 billion years ago. Planets like the Earth have changed a lot. Mars has changed a lot. The Moon has changed a lot. But comets have changed relatively little. So if we want to get a window into the things that were happening when the solar system was forming, comet stuff is the kind of stuff you want to study. So that's the reason why you know, scientists get excited. But there is a more general reason why perhaps all of us should get excited. And that has to do with the role that comets have played in making the Earth the way it is and making it possible for us to be here tonight and have this discussion. Uh, because when you look at the Earth, uh, where do the volatiles uh, on the Earth come from? The air in this room. The water that you drink. Where, where does that stuff come from? Well, very likely that stuff was brought to the early Earth by comets. So when you take a deep breath, you are breathing comet stuff. When you gargle after brushing your teeth, you're gargling with cometary water. Okay? And most importantly though, it is also very, very likely that comets brought to Earth the important organic molecules, the complicated molecules made of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, out of which perhaps life evolved on the Earth. Now that's a point that I'll come back to several times in, in, in this talk, because we know a lot of things about comets. This last one about comets bringing in the essential molecules to make life possible is something that we suspect but we have not been able to prove yet. And so one of the big tasks that you'll hear about of what it is that scientists are trying to do is to actually resolve this issue. Are we really made of comet stuff? So you'll hear that from me several times during the next few minutes. But to begin, uh, so that's why comets should be important. Uh, I also just want to repeat something that I said at the very beginning that yes, there are a lot of comets in the solar system, and most of them don't spend a lot of time close to us, where we can study them easily, or close to the sun. Uh, most of them live at the edges of the solar system. And just so you know, we get through this, there are two far away places where most comets live most of the time. One is in a disk just outside the orbit of Neptune, 
and another one is in the sort of spherical shell that surrounds the inner solar system about halfway to the nearest star. And comets spend most of their time out there, and it's only when perturbation by a planet like Neptune changes the path of a comet, or perhaps a passing star passing fairly close to the sun changes the path of a comet, that a comet comes into the inner solar system where we can study it. So most comets live out uh, at the edges of the solar system, and only very few of them come close enough for us to study. But when they do, they are spectacular, because, uh, as we think we all know, Comets are essentially dirty snowballs made of ices and some other things we'll talk about. And when they're far away from the sun at the edges of the solar system where it's very cold, they don't do anything. But if they have their orbit changed in such a way that they come close to the sun, they start to heat up, the ices evaporate, and wonderful things happen. And you see a very spectacular comet where right in here is the real heart of a comet, and called the nucleus, that we'll talk about in a minute. Okay? And that's the dirty snowball. And when it gets close to the sun, the ices heat up, gas, mostly water vapor, comes off, carries with it whatever solid material there's in a comet, and you get this thing around the comet, which is basically gases and dust coming off, called the coma of a comet. And as the comet moves around the sun, some of this stuff gets left behind, forming these distinct tails, this yellow tail being the dust particles that have been left behind, and this bluish thing being some of the gases that have been left behind that, in the process of leaving the comet, have, had, have lost an electron. UV light from the sun has ripped off an electron. So you have a nice dust tail and a beautiful uh, iron tail. And these things are colossal. These are scales of millions of miles. But all of the stuff comes from the activity of the nucleus. So what we'll be talking about mostly tonight is what do we know about the nucleus, the heart of a comet. And the story begins about 60 years ago, where this gentleman, Fred Whipple, uh, basically on the basis of uh, uh, observations such as this, try, try to explain what might be, uh, what might the nucleus of a comet look like. And he came up with uh, this idea that I mentioned, that basically comets are nothing more than dirty snowballs. If you read books, uh, people always use big words and they call it the icy conglomerate model of the comet nucleus, just dirty snowball. Uh, ice with some junk thrown in, okay. And uh, so back 60 years ago, uh, Fred Whipple figured out, well, you know, that's what comet has to be. But no one had seen a comet nucleus up close because you can't really see them from the Earth. They're too small, too far away. So you have to send a spacecraft to, to a comet. And the first time that happened was in 1986 when ESA, the European Space Agency, built a spacecraft called JATO, which encountered Comet, uh, comet Halley on its visit to uh, uh, the inner solar system. It comes by every 76 years. And in March of 1986, the Europeans did something quite amazing. This is a sort of a little fuzzy, a fuzzy graphic, but basically it shows that in March of that year, the Europeans succeeded in flying Giotto within about 600 kilometers of the nucleus of Comet Halley. Uh, so for the first time, taking pictures of what a comet nucleus looks like, incidentally proving that Fred Whipple was right, and also obtaining some important measurements as to what some of these things that were coming off the nucleus really were. I mentioned vapor, I mentioned dust, things of that sort of, what, what really are those things? And so the, for the first time in 1986, uh, we could answer those questions. So here is a picture of the nucleus of Comet Halley. This is about 12 miles in, in scale. Uh, what, you, what you see here is stuff that is boiling off. The sun is off in this direction. So this is the sunlit side, the warm side of the nucleus. And there are some things to notice here. That comet nucleus 
is irregular in shape, but look at the surface, the actual surface. It's not bright snow, it's actually black. And if you make a measurement, this thing is really, really black, okay? But uh, in spite of that, uh, when it heats up, a lot of gases come off, and those gases are mostly H2O, water. But there are some other ices that are vaporizing, things like carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and things like HCN. But it's primarily water, as Whipple has said. Now, Giotto, in addition to taking pictures like this, uh, had instruments that could analyze from the light emitted by the gases what the stuff was, and that's where the information comes that this stuff is water. But more importantly, it had an instrument that as the spacecraft flew uh, in the vicinity of the comet, dust particles from the comet, or whatever was coming off, hit one of the instruments, and that instrument was designed in such a way that when a particle hit, because uh, the encounter was at very high speed, it would vaporize, and there essentially was a thing called a mass spectrometer, which could pick up the fragments of whatever was vaporized and measure their mass and their, determine their composition very, very accurately. And we learned a very important thing, that what a dirty snowball comet nucleus is, it consists of ices, mostly water ice, okay? but it also consists of rocky minerals of the types that we find on the earth. Things, you know, little things that make, things like pyroxenes and uh, other minerals on the earth. Things that consist of magnesium, silica, iron, things of that sort. So basically rocky stuff. And finally, and most interestingly, Giotto found that there was a third thing, maybe related to this black stuff that we see on the surface. Material, or grains of material, that was mostly carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Now remember at the beginning, I said that some people suspect that some of the interesting molecules that led to the, led to the evolution of life uh, came from comets. Well, that's the kind of stuff you would expect to be made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. <coughs> and so you can ask me the question, well, what kind of stuff was this? And we could finish the lecture right here. Unfortunately, in 1986, the instrument that Giotto had was able to tell you that Yes, carbon was there, hydrogen was there, oxygen was there, nitrogen was there, but couldn't tell you what the molecule was, okay? So that remained the mystery. And so, just to kind of make sure that we all pay attention, I have three jars here, which basically represent the results from the Giotto mission of what comets are like. This jar contains ice, okay? So about a third of comet stuff is ice. Mostly water ice, but there's also carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, okay? And this we know very well because when the comet heats up, these things vaporize, become vapors, and spectrometers are very good at, de at detecting the kind of molecules that are coming out. So this we know really, really well, okay? Now, Giotto said that there was some rocky stuff. So here is some rocky stuff. Now unfortunately, Giotto could tell us, well, fortunately, Giotto could tell us that this stuff had some magnesium in it, had some iron in it, but couldn't tell us exactly what the minerals were. Fortunately, in a minute or so, we'll be talking about a mission that actually, after Giotto, went to a comet, collected dust, brought it back to the Earth for us to analyze. So we now know what this stuff is, okay? And that leaves this stuff, the black stuff, the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen stuff, the stuff that perhaps we are all made of, ultimately. This is the stuff that we want to know what it is, okay? And so the rest of the lecture is going to focus on how we are trying to answer a question of what is really in this jar, okay? All right, so just remember, Comet consists of three things, ices, minerals, and mysterious organic black stuff, okay? All right, so if everybody's good with that, let's proceed. We we're stuck in, the, in 1986, but lots of things have happened since then. So <clears throat> we learned a lot of things 
from Halley, but what sorts of things didn't we learn? Well, I just said some of these, but let me repeat them. Uh, we noticed in the Halley pictures that the surface was covered with black stuff. Supposedly, what that black stuff is, is when the ices evaporate and the organic material gets left behind, just like a dirty snowbank in Binghamton in the springtime, okay? Uh, that's probably what it is, but we don't know chemically what it is, okay? And, and so that's, that's what we want to know. And uh, what actually is the comet like below the surface? Okay. We see some stuff coming off, but is that really representative? And then finally, uh, since eventually we might want to go to a comet and land on it and do some stuff, it would be nice to know what kind of texture a comet is. Is it really nice and hard so you can land on it easily? Or is it very, very soft, very porous? Okay. So those are all things that are interesting, which Giotto couldn't answer. So what do we do? Well, we go to a next space mission. <laughs> this one from NASA. Uh, about 20 years after Giotto, it took a while. A mission called Deep Impact. And some of you may remember that on July 4, 2005, something quite spectacular happened that this mission did that I want to tell you about. So let's talk a little bit about the Deep Impact mission, which was designed to answer some of these questions that Giotto left unresolved. So, Deep Impact uh, was basically trying to answer these two things that were left behind. What is below that black surface? And what is the deep inside of a comet really like? So how do you do that? Well, the way it was done is to build an interesting spacecraft that consists of two parts. There is a part that's just like the Giotto spacecraft, has cameras and spectrometers and can observe what's happening. But there is another part called the impactor, which is just a very heavy piece of a guided missile that you're going to hit the comet with at very high speed. It's going to produce a crater. Stuff's going to get thrown out. And you're going to be able to dig stuff up from below the surface your spectrometers can analyze it, so you can answer the question, what's below the surface? And since you know how much energy you're putting into the impact from the hole that you make, you can say something about the mechanical structure of the surface. Is it hard rock type stuff? Is it very, very soft? Okay, so that's the experiment. And uh, uh, this is the actual spacecraft, just to give you an idea of scale. The top part of it is the part that's going to survive, it's going to observe the event, and here, this thing is the impactor that you are going to uh, hit the comet with at very high speed, and have the rest of the spacecraft look at and see what's going to happen. So, uh, the target for this particular mission was a comet called Temple 1. And I just want to emphasize something. This is the nucleus of Temple 1. We didn't know what this thing would look like until Deep Impact got there in 2005. This is a Deep Impact image taken in 2005. The comet is about, I have a scale in kilometers, about three, four miles across. And although I show you this picture, in hand so you can see a surface feature. Remember, this comet, like Halley, is essentially black, okay? So I've made it sort of look so you can see, see things there, but just think this, this thing is actually black. The other thing I did was uh, there, there is gas and dust coming off. I wanted to emphasize the nucleus itself so the picture is processed so that you don't see that. So just think that you know, this is a good representation, except it's much too bright, and we've kind of gotten rid of all the dust and gas that is going off. But this is what this particular comet looks like. And uh, the idea was, while the main spacecraft was taking pictures like this, for the impactor to hit the surface, make a crater, throw stuff out, and see what would actually happen. <coughs> well, all of this took place on July 4, 2005. Uh, the mission was a great success. This is the cover of the Sky and Telescope. And down below here, you see a series of images taken by the main spacecraft just before the impact, at the time of the impact, and now stuff is being thrown out. And 
in the time sequence, of course, stuff from farther below gets thrown out later. So if you can analyze what is being thrown out as a function of time, you get a profile of what is on the inside of the comet. Okay? And here you see just a better, better picture of this colossal impact that was produced, throwing out stuff all over the place. Well, what did we actually learn? Did we, did we answer some of those questions? Well, I'm sorry to show you this, but I just want to kind of impress you that um, these spacecraft do have instruments, and what you're looking at here is a spectrum of some of the stuff that was thrown out uh, by the deep impact event. Uh, and it doesn't really matter, but what we're looking at are at infrared wavelengths, wavelengths that our eyes can't see, but the spectrometer can see, uh, which are sensitive to the light from different gases that are being thrown out above the, above the comet. Okay? And what is interesting here is before the impact, uh, you see something like this, which basically is the black surface with no features, there's no gas being thrown out. And after the impact, a lot of things are coming out. A lot of water vapor, H2O, a lot of CO2, okay? And something quite interesting here, and remember, back to Giotto, there's stuff that consists of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Well, here we can do a little bit better, because as we dig into the surface, more of this strange stuff comes out. What is this stuff? Well, the spectrometer on deep impact, again, is not very good. And all it can tell is that the stuff that's coming out is something that has a lot of hydrogen carbon bonds, CH. Okay, that's what you would expect from big molecules that you know could could be of interest to biology. Uh, but you notice the X here. Spectrometer is not smart enough to tell you what the rest of the molecules are. Okay, so so yes, there is a lot of stuff that's got a lot of carbon and hydrogen down below the surface, but again, we still don't know what it is. Okay, so the story continues. But uh, what about the rest of the experiment? Well, I said that. One of the reasons you want to have an impact, if you know how much energy you're putting in, you want to see how big a hole you made, because that will tell you something about the structure of a comet. Well, in a way, the deep impact uh, experiment was a little too successful. A lot of stuff got thrown out. And while the main spacecraft is observing, the stuff is you know, hanging out there, not falling back to the surface, gravity is very, very low, so it's doing it very, very slowly, okay? So the deep impact spacecraft never actually saw the crater that it made. So is it a failure? Well, we'll come back to that, but actually it wasn't a failure because uh, spacecraft spent enough time around here that some of you can see that there are rays of stuff. Stuff is being thrown out and it actually is very, very slowly falling down. And some of that you can actually track in these images. So if you can see stuff falling, you can tell how strong gravity is, okay? And if you can tell how strong, how, what does gravity depend on? It depends on the mass of the object and the radius of the object, okay? So uh, basically, uh, from the gravity, we can get the mass. From the pictures, you can get the size. Okay, so you divide the mass by the volume, you get the density, all right? Now, okay, people who know the answer, uh, not fair to answer your question, okay? What do you think the density of a comet turns out to be? Somebody who doesn't know the answer, guess. One. One, well, that's a good point, because I said it's mostly made of ice, okay? But it actually turns out to be only a third uh, as dense as water or as ice. Why? because it's full of holes. It's got to be, because it's water ice, okay, density one, as the man said. It's got rocky stuff, which is more than one. It's got that organic stuff, which is you know, more than one. So, so to get a density of, of, of one third of water or ice, it's gotta be full of holes. So comets are very poor stuff, okay? So we have learned something, okay. Well, the main spacecraft, the one we're just talking about, took this, these pictures. Uh, after 2005, the impactor, of course, vaporized on impact. The main spacecraft survived, and so what do you do with it? Just want to briefly mention that what NASA decided to do with it is to send it on to another comet. And so five years later, in fact, about a year ago, 
uh, that same spacecraft encountered a second comet, and this is now shown to scale. This is the Temple 1 nucleus that we just saw, and this is the nucleus of a comet called Hartley 2, which the Deep Impact spacecraft encountered last fall. Uh, now, remember, the impactor is gone, it's vaporized, so all we get are pictures, and we get spectra of stuff coming out. And uh, so we've been talking about the fact that some of the gases that come off, a lot of it is water, some of it is carbon dioxide. That's what you get when you vaporize dry ice, okay? Now, something very interesting happened during the Hartley 2 encounter. Here's just a, a close-up picture of Hartley 2, and this one has been processed so you can see the stuff evaporating from the surface, okay? The question is, okay, so we have water ice, we have carbon dioxide ice, are they well mixed homogeneously? So they all come out and say, you know, the same amounts? Well, we didn't know the answer, but because Deep Impact spacecraft has a nice spectrometer, you can look at this light in a light emitted by water vapor, carbon dioxide, and answer the question. So the next slide kind of answers the question. Up here, now spectrometers don't see as well as cameras normally, okay? So it's a little fuzzy, but here is the picture I showed you. And here, if you had eyes that were sensitive to infrared light emitted by water vapor, that's what you see up there. And if you had eyes that were sensitive to carbon dioxide emission, you'd see this. And just notice that the things are coming from different places, okay? The water and carbon dioxide are not intimately mixed. Comets are kind of homogeneous. They're put together in some kind of strange way, where a uh, strange fashion where, you know, part of it is like this and part of it is like that. It's not necessarily well mixed. So that was some, something that was very, very interesting, but doesn't really get us uh, to uh, the point where we want to be. Where, yes, you know, because we can do the spectroscopy, we can again tell where the ices are evaporating. Uh, but uh, how about the other stuff that the comet is made of, the minerals and the organic stuff? Well, uh, let's move on and see if we can talk now about a way of answering the question of what this mineral stuff is. All right, well to do that, we're going to talk about another mission to a comet, uh, a mission that uh, has, goes by several names, but originally started off in 1999, a mission called Stardust. And the objective of Stardust was to go to a comet called Vild 2. It's not wild, it's Vild because Mr. Dr. Vild was German, so it's a Vild 2. And uh, uh, the purpose of this mission was to fly a spacecraft close enough that you could actually collect some of the dust and bring it back to the Earth for analysis. Now, what's difficult about it is that with today's technology, it is, in general, hard to fly by a comet slowly. Although, uh, as, as we'll see, we're just getting to the point where we can do that. So you're flying by a comet very, very fast, okay? And if you run into a particle, it will want to vaporize. So is there some way of preventing that from happening? Well, it turns out that ices vaporize very easily. Probably the organic stuff vaporizes very easily. But rocky stuff doesn't vaporize quite as easily. So uh, is there a way of capturing the dust without having it all vaporize? And the quick answer is that if I'm trying to if I run into a fast moving particle and have it hit something very hard, it's gonna slow down very quickly, heat's gonna get generated, it's gonna vaporize. But now think if I had a room full of styrofoam cups, okay? <laughs> and the particle hit the styrofoam cups. Well, each styrofoam cup would slow it down a little bit, uh, wouldn't stop it, okay? And if I had enough styrofoam cups, I could probably, you know, s slow the particle down enough so it wouldn't completely vaporize, and then I could return the styrofoam cup. Well, that's not exactly how you do it, but what you can do is use something quite magic called aerogel, which is basically just silica, S-I-O, so it's like, like a smoke. It's a, this thing has an incredibly low density, okay? And uh, 
if you have stuff hitting this, there is a chance that some of it will slow down enough so that it will not completely vaporize, even at an encounter speed of 14,000 miles an hour. So that's an incredible, incredible speed. And so in the early 1990s, in the late 1990s, this experiment was designed using aerogel, where basically you would build a spacecraft where each of these things is a little cell of aerogel, it's fairly long, and when you get close to the comet, you would take, open up the cover and fly through the vicinity of the comet, and any dust that was in there might, you know, hit one of these things, and the very volatile stuff, the ices, or the organics might completely vaporize, but the minerals wouldn't. So if this really worked, and you could return this thing to the Earth, you could have cap you would have captured these things and tell us, you know, to answer the question of what are the minerals like. So here is just an example of somebody actually trying this in a laboratory. And a while ago I was talking about styrofoam cups. Well, you can't fly, you know, uh, a room full of styrofoam cups. Uh, you can fly small amounts of aerogel, which means that you can capture tiny micron-sized particles. But that's good enough, because if you can get those in the laboratory, you can answer what, what these things are like. So this was, this was the Stardust experiment. And uh, as I said, it was tested in a laboratory where each of these things is a little microscopic particle that was fired into the aerogel, was actually stopped. Some of it evaporated, but most of it remained intact. Here is the actual spacecraft collector. Each of these is a little aerogel cell. Uh, that experiment was done successfully, as we'll see. Uh, this capsule was returned to the Earth, and those of you who go to the National Air and Space Museum in Washington can actually see this, this, uh, the, re the remains of this capsule uh, is in the Smithsonian right now. Okay? But uh, I get ahead of the story here. So early in 2004, this particular spacecraft, Stardust, flew by a comet. This is uh, the collector that was exposed to the dust. Uh, particles hit the collector. And uh, two years later, the spacecraft and the capsule returned to the Earth, uh, landed at night in the Utah uh, desert. And this is this an actual picture of, of the capsule containing uh, the aerogel and supposedly the cometary particles. So here is the actual thing being opened very, very carefully. And yes, indeed, <coughs> if you look inside the little cells of aerogel, that's a track of a particle, a comet particle now, that came in and slowed down and stopped right here. So with careful techniques, you can extract that and you can get information on what this stuff is. So let me just show you one example. This is a real comet particle that was returned by Stardust. It's tiny, tiny. It's a fraction of a micron in size. Uh, but with modern techniques, you can analyze it to tell you what the minerals are. What is this kind of stuff? And you notice in this case, most of that stuff is what some of us would recognize as a common terrestrial mineral, pyroxene, uh, magnesium pyroxene. Okay? And this other stuff is iron sulfide. So the minerals uh, we know quite well from studying thousands and thousands of these kinds of particles. Uh, there's something here which I will mention. It says fine grain solar composition. Okay. Wow, well, you know what that stuff is? That stuff is related to the black stuff in here. So you say, okay, you know the answer now. Well, unfortunately, remember, we collected these things at 14,000 miles an hour. Okay. So there was some heating, and while the rocks survived, some of this stuff didn't completely survive. So what we have here is we have kind of the remains of what this stuff was, but we still don't have the real stuff. So we need to go on. Okay, we're, we're getting to the end here. All right, so uh, we did learn from Stardust that uh, what the minerals are in a comet, and we learned something quite interesting, which I just want to point out to you, that uh, we all suspected, as I said at the beginning, that comets mostly live at the edges of the solar system, so they should consist of things that formed at very low temperatures. And in part, that is true, but in the case of Bill 2, that particular comet at least, some of the minerals that were found 
were minerals that must have formed in places in the solar system where temperatures were quite hot, in other words, close to the sun. So somehow, the early nebula, gas and dust, out of which planets and comets formed, was somewhat mixed up. So that stuff that had formed originally close to the sun, temperatures were hot, got mixed in with the stuff at the outer edges. That's something that we didn't know, okay? And it's kind of interesting. All right, uh, we move on. Uh, so that was the those were the results of the, st of the start of spacecraft. And that spacecraft, after it returned material to the Earth, uh, returned a capsule to the Earth, but the main spacecraft was still in orbit. And so what did we do? Well, let's see if we can use that spacecraft to answer some of the outstanding questions that we still have. Now one of those questions, remember back to Deep Impact, Deep Impact made a crater. How big is that crater? Can we take this particular spacecraft, send it back to the comet that uh, Deep Impact visited, Temple 1, and see what the crater looks like? Well, that's a mission called Stardust Next, which actually successfully went back to Comet Temple 1 this last February, February 14th, and among many other things, it uh, looked at the region where the Deep Impact impactor hit, uh, to see what had actually happened. Because remember, we couldn't see it in 2005 because there's so much ejecta. But in the process, uh, this particular mission, Stardust Next, noticed some other interesting things about this comet, which I just want to mention briefly. Uh, the idea used to be that comets were kind of put together sort of randomly from different small pieces of ice and rock and so on, and very loosely put together, okay? Uh, so, in other words, you know, they're kind of randomly assembled. That's, remember, we talked about the fact that in the case of Hartley II, there are places where there's lots of carbon dioxide, there are places with lots of water. Things are not very well mixed. Uh, but here, we saw a comet where a lot of interesting things have happened, uh, quite different from what I have just described. And you can see uh, in this image, that there are some very, very smooth areas on this particular nucleus. Uh, and in a minute, you'll see that on this nucleus, there are also places where there are many, many layers. And so before I kind of explain some of that, let me show you some examples. So this, this is the same comet that was seen in 2005 by uh, the Deep Impact spacecraft. We want to go back to it and look at the crater and see some other things. Well. One of the things that we noticed, which is quite amazing, kind of, this is just a, a garish sketch here, is that there is a lot of layering on this comet. And specifically, there are places where material seems to have erupted from the subsurface of the comet, actually flowed onto the surface as like a lava, if you like, okay, and filled in the low places. So what may be happening here? Well, what we think is happening here is if you have a comet that comes close to the sun, stuff evaporates from the surface, so the surface uh, you know, uh, goes down with time, stuff, stuff leaves, the comet shrinks, okay? What also means is that heat from the sun penetrates down to deeper and deeper layers into the comet. Now if it turns out that there is some unstable material buried deep inside the comet, such that if you provide heat to it, okay, then it will vaporize and drive stuff to the surface. And we think that that is actually what's happening in this particular case uh, to produce these kinds of flows. So at least this comet has some very, very strange things that have happened to it. And here is just another view of some of the, the, the layers. i uh, show you one more example here. Uh, see some very, very definite layering, some very s smooth areas. The smooth areas always fill the low points on a comet, and we really think that we're, what we're looking at is material that erupted from inside the comet and covered the low places on the nucleus, something which we did not, did not really expect comets would ever do. Here is just a close-up of one of the flows, I think, that you can kind of see where stuff is, is flowing downhill from the interior comet. So comets can be quite complicated, and as this uh, view shows you, it can be layered, okay, something which we did not suspect. 
again, suggesting that in some cases comets have internal activity which exhumes stuff from the interior and it places it onto the surface where you can flow downhill and fill low points. So that's of interest to geologists. Uh, one of the other things that uh, is of interest to geologists is we know when a comet gets close to the sun, it loses material because uh, you know ices evaporate. But where is the material lost? Is it lost uniformly over the entire surface, or does the loss happen in particular places? Well, in the case of Comet Temple One, since we saw it in 2005 with Deep Impact, and again last February with Stardust Next, we can actually answer that question. And it turns out that most of the mass loss is associated with the edges of these smooth flows that have erupted onto the surface. And I'll just show you one, one quick example here. Uh, we're going to be looking at the edge of the smooth flow. And we have here a picture from Deep Impact in 2005 and a picture of Stardust Next uh, last February. And you can notice that there are places where things have changed. This is a distance of something like 30 or 50 yards. Uh, significant amount of material you know, has been evaporated. And that's kind of uh, where most of the evaporation occurs. So it's not uniform over the surface. It's, it's, uh, it's concentrated in some of these areas where relatively fresh material has erupted onto the surface. Uh, this is another view of the same comet. And the only reason I show you this is that if you look in some of the areas, there are knobs of material that have been less sticking out. Uh, and so what is happening here? Well, uh, what's, what's hap has been happening here is that material uh, has been sublimating, leaving the comet, okay? And from the height of these knobs, you can estimate how much stuff has left. And these things, in some, some, uh, some cases, are a couple hundred feet high. So quite a lot of stuff has been removed from the surface, as you might expect from sublimation. So uh, finally, just to finish up, uh, uh, the reason, as I said, that we were interested in going back to Comet Temple 1 is to finish up the deep impact experiment. That was the collision with the comet. Made a hole, how big is the hole? Well, uh, we succeeded in actually looking at, taking a good image of that particular area at a reasonable resolution okay, of you know, something like this scale. Okay. Uh, and we can show you what is there. And from that, we can answer this question of what kind of material are we dealing with. So let's look at the, those results. Uh, the crater is not spectacular. Okay. <laughs> Here is a deep impact image, 2005, before the crater was made. Okay. Here is a Stratus Next image, a different camera, slightly worse resolution. I think most of you can see there's kind of a depression in here, okay? Uh, and I can show you a slightly, perhaps better picture. It's this thing over here that wasn't there before that is there now. It's about 50 meters, 50 yards across, okay? And from that, we can answer the question of what kind of stuff are we talking about? Well, okay, here's the answer. The crater is about 50 meters across at the expected, and from that, we can figure out what kind of surface you're dealing with. And this is the key here. It's basically lightly packed snow. The kind of stuff that you don't get in Binghamton because it's always wet and, you know, but the, if you go to the Rocky Mountains, that's the kind of stuff it is, okay? So we've answered that question. So we did some neat things, which I uh, kind of want to summarize here for you, that uh, in the case of this nucleus, for the first time, we have evidence that some comet nuclei are not just randomly put together, but they're actually layered because material erupts onto the surface. Ge geology is going on. Uh, and I didn't really emphasize that, but some of the smooth areas are extremely smooth. Nothing very much has happened in terms of impacts onto them. They're very, very young. So this stuff, for some comets, is still actually going on. So comets are geologically active. And uh, most of the material that a comet loses actually comes from these scarps, from places where new material was not placed on the surface. Those things recede fairly quickly. That's where most of the gases come from. Interesting geology. But from our perspective, uh, 
what we have learned is we now know what it takes to go to a comet, land on a comet, and return a sample. Because from the size of a deep impact crater, we know that for some comets, the surface is very loose and porous. It's very easy to sample. Okay? It's also smooth, because we saw those, those areas. So it's an easy place to land. Okay? So a comet like Temple 1 is an ideal target to actually go there pick up a sample that includes not only the ices and the rocks, but the magic black stuff that we still don't understand, and bring it back to Earth for analysis. So the obvious question you're going to ask, we're almost done here, is this, uh, you know, uh, when is this going to happen? Well, <coughs> unfortunately, uh, in terms of NASA plans to send a mission back to Temple 1 that can actually land on a comet, one of the smooth areas, uh, you know, excavate the sample, preserve the sample, bring it back to Earth for analysis so we can answer this question. That's going to be 10, 15, maybe even 20 years from now. A long, long time. So, what about, was that hopeless? Are we going to wait 20 years before we know an answer? Well, maybe not, because there is something else that's happening. And at the beginning of the lecture, I mentioned the European Space Agency, ESA, Giotto to Comet Halley, 1986. Well, ESA has not been asleep, and the European Space Agency has a mission called Rosetta, which is out in space right now, and it's on its way to a comet. There's a typo up there. The comet is churyumov gerasimenko That's a G. Uh, and this is a mission that was launched by ESA in 2004, and on a 10-year trajectory to good old Comet CG, it will get there in May 2014, and while it will not completely answer the question of what the magic black stuff, magic black stuff is, it's going to be a big step forward. So let me tell you about that. And the reason for that is that the, Giotto, the Rosetta spacecraft actually includes a lander. I mentioned in the lecture that comets are very hard to fly by slowly, okay? Uh, and there are some tricks that you can use, and Rosetta actually uses some of these. So Rosetta is going to approach its comet fairly slowly, slowly enough that it can deploy a lander that will land on the surface. And that particular lander, which is shown here in a graphic form, has as one of its objectives to do chemistry. It plans to sit on the surface, extract the sample from the subsurface, and do a chemical analysis. Okay? So you might again say, okay, well, 2014, we will know the answer. Well, the problem is that you can't do the kind of chemistry on the surface of a comet today that you could do on the Earth. So if you could bring those samples back to the Earth, yeah, you could answer that question, okay? Uh, Rosetta is going to attempt to give us a partial answer, okay? But again, because of the limited abilities of the, space, uh, of the spacecraft, uh, I don't think we'll answer the question completely. So my parting words to you are that the big question, are we made of comet stuff? We don't know today, Rosetta, may provide the next big step in a few years, but it's actually going to take going to a comet, landing on a comet, bringing a sample back to the Earth for analysis, as we did with the Stardust samples, before we can answer that question. So, as of today, I cannot answer the question, are we made of comet stuff? But some of the people in the audience uh, looked at me like, maybe you guys are comets, commentary people. <laughs> so, thank you very much. That's all I got. Pleasure to have listen to this presentation. Oh, it's always and a pleasure a, to be here. Oh. As a token of appreciation, we'd like to present you with a t-shirt. All right, Copernic. Okay. If you need a size change, let us know. All right, that sounds wonderful. And listen, uh, actually, uh, as a sign of my appreciation, I have something for you guys. Okay. And if I don't have enough of them, 
then uh, I'll be happy to supply some more. But uh, uh, since everybody very politely listened to a lecture on comets, I think everybody should get a comet badge. Okay. And these are special badges from the Stardust Next mission. Okay. And so I think there's en enough for everybody in the audience. And if there isn't, okay. I'll supply some more. I'll tell you what, I'll pass around for many of you who will not be around. And then if we don't have enough, we can get a hold of Dr. Berger to get him to the, the cast room. So take one and pass it around, please.